You're listening to the Mobcast Network. Welcome, my friend, to the catacombs. <laughs> I kind of wanted to be like, welcome back, my friends, to the catacombs that never end. I was kind of glad you go there. Bro. We I, got I, some I, movies down inside. Down inside. <laughs> <laughs> Let's summarize what we have. We're the, deep, we're the deep cut podcast of the Couple Week Cantina. If it's weird and wonderful, it's down here. Or forgotten. Well, forgotten, yeah. In this, this is, case, I think it's I forgotten. Th- I definitely think this is a forgotten film. Yeah. I... I I remember it when it came out and then never seen it. So right. I forgot that it existed for a very long time. And uh, so I'm your Native American pop culture spirit guide, Scotty, and I'm joined by my co-host. Co-host. It's me, Drew. How are you doing, Drew? I am delightful. Wonderful. Have you seen anything recently? It's um, Oscar season, so. Yeah, I mean, I've been watching some weird stuff. I haven't I haven't seen a ton of the Oscar films. I watched Jojo Rabbit. Has that even got an, a nom anywhere? Yeah. It's got yeah. like four. It's got... Uh, Screenplay or uh, adapted screenplay, um, best picture. Scar- uh, Scarlett Johansson's got uh, supporting actress in it. She's good. Everybody's good. The cast in that movie is fantastic. I like the movie. There's a lot. no issue with it. Um, I got a little bored in it, but I still enjoyed the movie. I laughed. The first ten minutes of that movie is maybe the first ten minutes my favorite of all time. It's great. It it's, is so it's funny. It's so brilliant. I just don't know what to say. I, 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 I liked it. I was surprised how wholesome it is, even about Nazis. Yeah, it's <laughs> and it's phenomenal. It's like it's not pro Nazi at all. It's great. Yeah, I think Sam Rockwell's wonderful in it too. Oh, Sam Rockwell's great. Kills it. Just yeah. Totally Totally kills it. So I great movie. Uh, it's it's not my favorite thing, but I can't say I haven't seen all the movies yet. Right. I've so, seen most of them. I, yeah. I've not seen Parasite or Little Women, and I think I've seen the rest of them though. So yeah, Parasite's on my list. I've, seven I've just, out of nine is not bad. Yeah, and you know this airs after, so we'll know who won because yep. we were recording in the Oscars or, being, or tonight as we record. So yeah, we still don't know. But by the time you listen, you'll be like, yeah. So it's like a long pregnant pause, and the best picture goes to for us. I think I think uh, if I'm a betting man, and I'm not, but I would I, would, I my money I think 1917 is the one to beat. Um yeah, because you know here's the thing: 1917 is 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 my favorite movie I've seen this year, even though technically it was released last year, right? To be qualified for the Oscars. So it had limited release and gave an Oscar run. So it's technically a 2019 movie. And we've talked about it before. That's my favorite movie. Currently it's my favorite movie. It's going to take a lot of magic to, to, when I say favorite movie, it's just something that I'm, I'm spellbound by. I gotcha. Um, so I get it. I, I don't know. For some reason, part of me thinks Once Upon a Time in Hollywood has a chance at Best Picture, and I think 1917 sweeps every other category it's in, because I think Sam Mendes is up for director as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's up for director. Uh, Roger Deakins should completely get the, it's, it's, the cinematography Oscar. I don't think it wins for writing. Um, or it didn't win for no, <laughs> yeah, I don't, in, in I don't, the present I think, now. I don't think it. I don't think it's going to win for writing. Yeah. Um. Since it's a, ori- I think it's original screenplay for that one. And I think if it goes to anybody, it's going to be. I think if Tarantino wins anything, he'll win writing again. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure that that's almost a lock. Sure. Um. But we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um. My gut. My gut says this. Here, here's what. We're so like for. Um, supporting actor, it's so the five nominees, four of them have Oscars, one doesn't. Right. I'm pretty sure the guy who doesn't get the Oscars getting the Oscar. Maybe. It it and they but, snubbed Deacons for quite a few years before he finally got his first Oscar, and he's the greatest DP that we've ever had. Also, yeah, that's true. However, when actors they they look at them in a different kind of light. Absolutely. And so they also look at your body of work. Yep. And he's been snubbed a few times too. I think Brad Pitt's deserves it, deserving yep. it. And yep. it's like, and he's good in Once Upon a Time. Yeah, Hollywood. he's great. And so he's absolutely great. But and and, and of course he's against De Niro, Pesci, which uh, I don't think they deserve. I I did not care uh, for that movie. Uh, I didn't either. Um, uh, Pacino and. Uh, Tom Hanks is um, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. 
But I think in the end, I think, I mean, Brad Pitt's been kind of sweeping. Brad, Brad Pitt's role, though, is actually interesting. Right. And I feel like it's it's a better performance. Everyone else is kind of playing roles they've played a lot. Right. Um, and that's including Tom Hanks. Right. He can play a sensitive old man very well. Um, I, I think um, for s- supporting actress, I'm going ScarJo. She's nominated twice. She's going to win one. Yeah. I think out of the two categories, she has the better shot at uh, supporting. Yep. For Jojo Rabbit, because she's really, really good in Jojo she's Rabbit. She's brilliant. She's great. In Jojo. She's one of the highlights of Jojo Rabbit. Yep. And then um, actor, um, I would, I know they're going to give it to Joaquin Phoenix. They're going to give it to Joaquin Phoenix. I, if they don't, I'm really super, I'll be super surprised. God, that movie's terrible, though. But he's really good in it. No, his performance, you're right. His performance is fantastic. He's, There's he's, nothing I can say negative about his performance. Right, his, 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 I just found it very boring and a dreadful piece of poop. Right, but it, his performance is great in that dreadful. It's great. So, and I think they're going to do that for both for both actor and actress. Uh, and actress is it's going to be Renee Zellweger and Judy, which is it's from I've not seen it, and yeah. I know Steph loves it, but it's mostly mostly just trash. And then yeah. that she's amazing in it. Right. And so they're going to reward her for because she's been. I mean, both of them have been winning all the other awards. Right. She, then, so that's what I call the dumpster in the dumpster fire. Right. right? Or maybe they're the fire. They're right, the passion. Fire. Either way, but one, they're one of the others. Right. They're not the total dumpster fire. Right. Right. Um, um, I'm with you. Uh, if uh, if if Joaquin doesn't win, if the academy does something, and they would, because every like it, the like, academy's made up of like senior citizens. Right. And so if the academy does white well, senior citizens, no, they, they've gotten a lot better in the last couple of years. They've yeah, worked, that's true. They've been trying to sneak in some diversity. They haven't got a pop culture Native American spirit guide yet. I'm I'm available. Um, <laughs> Shameless tie it in. <laughs> Anything I can do, but um, Jonathan Price, who is a brilliant actor, mm-hmm. and he's absolutely wonderful in the Two Pubs. Right. It's a good movie. It's on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's good. And then uh, Antonio Banderas for uh, Plain and Glory, which I've yeah, not which seen. which is really interesting. Which that, I've not seen, yeah. but I hear it's great. So also, two guys who have got well-earned body of work Yep, that could get... Because the, the Academy rarely goes... Every now and then they'll go for, you know... A performance, but they'll look at your body of work and the, like DiCaprio was nominated for a million times before he, right. he finally got his before they Susan Lucci'd him. And that's so, right, that's totally right. Uh, I for actor category, if I if I was if I if it was me, I'm picking DiCaprio. He's he's better in Once Upon a Time on Hollywood than Joaquin is in Joker. Oh, 100 percent. The whole thing where him talking about uh, uh, when he's he screwed up his lines, he's back in his trailer. Yeah, and he's just like, "Why can't I just have one drink or two drinks? No, I gotta have eight. I yeah, he's he's solid and just, I mean, just amazing. I was like, I'd love to direct that. I just yeah, yeah. Mm, mm, would love to. And so, um, uh, for best uh, director, I got Mendez. Uh, best picture, I have Jojo Rabbit. I think they'll split. Hmm, interesting. I think they'll split, but in my heart, heart, hearts, I want them to split. Yeah, but because I'd like it, Taika to get one. But I think he's gonna get one for writing, so he'll get. It. I think he gets his tonight. Yeah, we'll talk about Taika more on the Mandalorian show. <laughs> yep. So let's talk about something uh, not current. We'll talk about an old movie. Uh, we saw No Escape from 1994. You ever heard of it? Well, there's one other thing to when you go looking. There's also another great movie called No Escape, starring Lake Bell and the Owen, the the brother with the big nose. What's his name? Luke Wilson, Owen Wilson. So it's uh, Lake Bell and, and Owen Wilson. Have you ever seen that one? Oh, both Wilsons are in it? No, just, just one. Just so one. Just the the Luke, blonde Wilson. Uh, blonde Owen. Wilson. Owen. Owen. And Lake Bell. Oh, yeah. Who I think oh, wow. is... I think... Uh, I, yeah. Oh, wow. But I think Lake Bell is just stunning. And do, you have to, do you have to escape? There's no escape. Oh, wow. Don't, <laughs> have oh, you seen wow. that movie? You've no, never seen it? No. Oh, wow. That's one of the most intense movies I've ever seen in my entire life. All right. Now, granted, it's, again, because I'm a family man... Um, that's a fantastically well-made movie, but this is not that one, right? No, no, this is this, this is, is a magical movie. <laughs> this is No Escape, nineteen ninety four. Uh, Drew, you picked this one, and I honestly, I'm I'm happy that you did. It's I I, I was you know spoiler alert, I was delighted, and I hope you guys are too. You need a, the catch about this film is that it's not available streaming. It's hard to find, which is which is uh, a damn shame. And you you can buy copies of it like on Amazon. Some of them are expensive. Yeah, though. but I think I, I think. On Amazon, I, th- I found it for about twelve bucks. Yes, that's still kind of expensive for, for a ninety four. D- yeah, yeah, for a D- it's not a Blu ray. It's for a DVD. You're right. right, twelve bucks for it. Right. And you're, you know, and it's, I don't think they've produced it since when it came out. Right. From DVD back. And in I don't know if it's been buried. Like if there's an embarrassment over it, I hope not. I, I don't know. So no escape. We'll listen to the trailer now. Welcome to the prison of the future. 
Prisoner 2675 has been delivered, sir. There's no warden here, no guards, no cell. This is it. He's military trained, you realize that? Somebody taught him how to kill. Ray Liotta. We're outnumbered six to one. Now I'm gonna kill you. No escape. You want it? Come and get it! Rated R. Starts Friday, April 29th at theaters everywhere. So yeah, that's a movie. All right, so... <laughs> Here we go. So it's directed by Martin Campbell, which is important for uh, James Bond fans. Yeah. So uh, I think he's directed the two greatest modern Bond films, uh, GoldenEye Casino Royale. Uh, I am not a Bond fan. Are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm a Bond. Not a die hard, but, die hard, but GoldenEye is my all time favorite James is your, Bond is, and Casino Royale is my all time favorite modern Bond. Yeah, I, so I hate all the other Bonds. <laughs> I like the way they look, but I just, I just, I don't know. I'm just not. All right. I'm. As a kid, I watched them because uh, it was like, because it, 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 how could you not? Because it was like the C, remember remember uh, the ABC Sunday movie of the week. Oh yeah, and they and they always had the Bond. And it was always Moonraker. takes danger into his own hands. He's on his last leg, sir. He's a man of steel. Moonraker 1, lift off. It's 007. And he's out of this world. Expel him! Roger Moore stars in Moonraker. Next. When we t- compare, like who's your who's your who's your Bond? Mine's Roger Moore, mainly because Sunday. Sunday yeah, that same here. ABC movie. And I was like, week. this dude's a wiener. He's like an old man. With it's, it's just I don't care. He's just like maybe when I'm old, I can still get chicks. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> so uh, he also did. Um, so he did GoldenEye, Casino Royale, The Mask of Zorro, <laughs> and he also directed um, Brian Reynolds and Green Lantern. Yeah, that's a tragedy. Uh, it's written by Michael Galen and Joel Gross. Um, they basically have done this. Um, they've got two short films, Intelligence and Blind Man's Bluff, between them. But they, this is all they did, which is curious to me. We've a lot of these movies that we have come up with. I know have come up with writers who've got this as their only credit. Yep. How did they get that job? I don't yeah. <laughs> How do they? Ha- but but here's what blows me away. This film is very coherent. Right. Part of it's from Martin Campbell. Right. But I think the script was coherent. So how did they get this and nothing else? Right. And that may come up later in the box office numbers, but who knows? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, Directed by uh, DP was uh, Phil Mayhew, I think Mayhew. It's Mayhew. Mayhew. Thank you. And it's, the reason why I struggle with it because it's M E H E A E U X. It's very yeah. French. He did. <clears throat> Here's. I, I started with this one because it's going to end up on this show. He was the DP for Highlander Two: The Quickening. Oh my God! Which is my jam. I uh, love that movie. He was the he was the DP for Ruby. Oh wow! The Jack Ruby movie that yeah. came out in the early '90s. Uh, GoldenEye, The Mask of Zorro, uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, actually. Bicentennial Man. Yeah, it's a great movie. So good movie, such a good movie. I watched it recently. It holds up. And then, much like uh, a Green Lantern, he also was the DP for Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Oh boy! It was edited by it was edited by Terry Rawlings. Are you familiar? No. Nope. Alien, Blade Runner, Chariots of Fire. Good Goldeneye. God! Okay. Sadly, he passed away in April of 2019. Oh, that's a shame. He's a good editor. So, uh, so you know, normally we kind of it's kind of we were we sometimes we talk about composers and the composer of this was okay, but I wanted to really um, dive deep into uh, some of the other stuff, uh, the other positions on this film. Art directed by Ian Gracie, who worked on episodes two and three, The Great Gatsby from um, the most recent one, DiCaprio with the Wolverine, Alien Covenant, uh, and he's currently the supervising. Art director for the new Mulan. Good grief. <laughs> and then here's my favorites. <laughs> Set direction by Leslie Crawford, who did The Island of Dr. Moreau and Street Fighter. Oh, boy. So that basically looks to me that this is like, I have a set. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Costume design, Norman uh, uh, Morcow, who did, uh, get this, The Road Warrior, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Crocodile Dundee, and The Island of Dr. Moreau. What's crazy, though, is the costuming in this was actually really solid. Right. With a lot of really, like, 
post-apocalyptic, me- especially now knowing that, right. you can see her influence. Yeah, right. You can tell, like, you could, like, oh, this was in the Red Warrior. I mean, right. This, I mean, it, and that's what I thought was really interesting. Uh, sadly, Norma passed away in August of 2016. Music was by, uh, um, let's see, um, Granny Revel. Who did the crow? Oh, Graham Ravel. Graham Ravel, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Graham, I, I, yeah, that's where I was. I had I just misspelled it. That's my. Graham Ravel did the crow. Tomb Raider from two thousand one. No, he's fantastic. Gotham, Planet Terror, The Chronicles of Riddick, which you like. Um, <laughs> I like how you point that out. Like I'm like the only guy on earth that I likes think that movie. So because yeah, it's going to end up on the show. I, oh, like, I can't wait. I love I, it. I, I, we could do all three of them actually. I'd like to do Pitch Black. I like well, Pitch Black's a fantastic. Yeah, that's a whole separate sidebar. Uh, Fred, Freddy versus Jason, and one of my favorite 90, 90s films of all time. SFW. Oh, dude, that's a great movie. Stephen uh, Dorff, yeah. Stephen Dorff, right? Yeah. Like, I don't, I, I know like four people who know that movie. Yeah. You're one of them. Yeah. And so, so it's Love so it. good. It's a great movie. It's a great movie. It stars Ray Liotta as Captain J.T. Robbins. We know him from Goodfellas, Copland, Hannibal, Field of Dreams, and Casablanca in 1983. He was in a Casablanca TV show for that's CBS. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unreal. I did not know that was a thing. I did not either. I kind of want to watch it now. Separate podcast about <laughs> bad pilots. <laughs> it ran a season, so it was longer than a pilot. Uh, Lance Hankerson as the father. He, well, we love him. He's Bishop and Aliens. Uh, he's in Terminator. He's in Pumpkinhead. He's in Quick and the Dead. He's also in Man's Best Friend, which will probably end up on this kind oh, of podcast. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, he's that guy. He's that guy who's in these, like, these cult films. He's in a ton of them. But he's good. Oh, he's always good. He's the same thing every time. But he's the best part of it. You're yeah, like, you know normal. what you're going to get. And you're kind of like, it's like. Uh, oh, warm- he was totally bishop in this. Yeah, it's just, it's a good warm bath. I'm glad yeah. he's here. Yeah. <laughs> Ernie Hudson, uh, who's in Ghostbusters, The Crow, and on Oz, and among many other things. Uh, Stuart Wilson as uh, uh, Walter Merrick, uh, who's the best villain. He's This villain is so wasteful. Oh, he is yeah. so good. He's in Lethal Weapon 3, Terminator, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, and The Mask of Zorro, among other things. A lot of British. Oh, I did not realize that was him in we- Lethal Weapon 3. Yes, he's the- fantastic in that, too. Yeah, he's good. This guy is like a very good villain that plays it. V- he plays it very I well. Have, I mean, we just ride apart from him. You know, I bet he, I mean, he's around. I bet we can get him. I bet we can get him. Oh, my God. Oh, I'd love to direct that. Uh, Kevin Dillon as Casey. Yeah, he's fantastic. <laughs> um, Way before he was in Entourage. Yeah, so he's in Platoon, The Blob. Uh, we've done The Blob, but it's never been released. And, we're, and the, the, the Blob is a curse on this show, uh, on both the shows. Yeah. One day we're going to do one that's going to get come out. Uh, the, the very first version of Cold Movie Cantina was a show called Bros, Boos, and Movies. The very first one I recorded in West Virginia was the premise that we were all drunk and we did we watched the movie and then talked about it. And that didn't get released. And then the second time it, we tried to do it at uh, QuestCon, and we had two people show up for the thing, and so it didn't get released. No, <laughs> we still did the show though. Did uh, yeah. Kevin Dillon was also in a movie called? Did you come across a movie called The Rescue? Yeah, I did. Okay, great. Just making sure. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to throw that movie in the mix. Yeah, the, well, the Rescue, Entourage, and The Doors. He was in The Doors. Oh yeah. Uh, this was a surprise for me, and I love this guy too, uh, Kevin J O'Connor. Yep. Who uh, I first saw, and a lot of people like I first noticed. I didn't say I first saw, but I first noticed him in the Mummy. He's so good in the Mummy. Oh yeah, he sure is. He's so good in the Mummy. Uh, he's in Deep Rising, which will probably be on this. Love podcast. that movie. It's going to be one of the two podcasts. I don't know. He's in G.I. Joe: The Rise of Cobra as Doctor Mindbender, <laughs> which is also amazing. <laughs> he's in Van Helsing, and uh, just shout out to our last movie, FX. He's in FX Two. Yes. And then I wanted to end with uh, Don Henderson. Who was um, um, Moff Toggy? Oh yeah, or Tog or Tag? There, I've heard all three. In Star Wars: A New Hope, he's in Brazil, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, and sadly he died in 1997. I have his autograph. Nice. Um, are you ready to get into this? Let's do it. Make no sure. escape. A movie about Ray Liotta not smiling. Uh, hold on, let me get my other page. I'm missing a page. Oh, missing pages. This sucks. For Mr. Pickles. So I saw this movie in the theater. My dad took me to it. It's one of those things that'll always live. My dad didn't take me to many movies, but when he did, we chose some quality turds to go see together. I also made my dad go see Ninja Turtles. Maybe that's why he didn't take me to the movies anymore, because I was always dragging my old man to see these movies that... Uh, Oh, an army of darkness. That was another one. I made my dad go see with me, which he hated explicitly. There we go. 
I am now prepared. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. It's 20, 22, just two years from now. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and much like today, we have prisons run by corporations. Ex-Marine John Robbins is in prison for life after murdering his commanding officer during the opening credits of this film. <laughs> <laughs> that also featured a marching band. Yeah, that was a thing. See, he was ordered to kill innocent civilians in Benghazi. Where are her emails? Lock her up. Also, I don't think this was covered in Michael Bay's movie, 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. <laughs> oh, my God. He's one of the survivors of the Benghazi <laughs> incident. And he kill- yeah, see? But I digress. Do you not think that that's a little bit freaky, that that is the exact... A little bit. I, I mean, it's kind of like, um, 1994 called. They want their... 2012 back. I just, it just predicted the future just weirdly. Yeah, very strange. Um, so Robbins is basically a murder machine and he has escaped two level five prisons. So he's sending him to a level six prison where he meets the warden who owns the place. Uh, things don't go well and we'll just skip to the part where the warden in, uh, ends up kicking Robbins to a worse prison. Level seven on an island called Absalom. So he's dropped off by future copters. Which, ironically, aren't. <laughs> no, they're not. They're actually, do you have, is that a fact you're going to bring up? Yeah, yep. but you, you okay. can bring it up now. If you, no, I mean, they're, I think they're Russian, they if are I'm not Russian. mistaken. They they're like Russian. Russian helicopters that, so I thought they were models, because every time I watched it, I was like, that looks kind of like a model, because, you know, there is this, some, early on, there's some models in the scenes. Right. They were like, yeah, look at that cheese bowl. Um, but they weren't, they were actually flying real helicopters. Yep, they were. They're, that's what we're going to call them, future copters. And he lands in a bunch of rats who crawl all over him. Of course, you know, they might be good eating for later. He is then captured by a group of the, a group called the Outsiders. You know, Dallas, Johnny Cades, Soda Pop, Curtis, and Pony Boy. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Not those guys. But dude, imagine them in this film. I know. It'd be amazing. <laughs> anyway. Nope. These Outsiders are kind of what you get when you cross a, the population of Shawshank Redemption. And stick them at the end of the apocalypse now. And then have them shop, for, uh, shop at the Goodwill in Border Town. You know, beyond Thunderdome. So they are, there's a fight for dominance, and well, Robbins is a badass, and he wins, and is chased out of the compound because he's not going to join them. The outsiders catch up with him and fill him full of blow darts and leaves him for dead. But he ain't dead. This is a movie. <laughs> In case you forgot. He's found by some nicer people who we call the insiders. And by the way, they also dress in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles armor. No, not the group from Russell Crowe's. Anyway, never mind. This, that's my only insider joke I had. This is led by Bishop from Aliens with his buddy Winston from Ghostbusters and a few others. These guys are all right. Uh, they have their own society where you pull your weight and you'll be good or not. You get kicked out. We meet some zany characters. Casey, a young dude who looks uh, looks up to Robbins for surviving the outsiders. King, a flamboyant guy who helps new people. Killian, a resident mixologist who brews a mighty fine drink. And also Mol- Molotov cocktails. Uh, this is all over solved by the father, who may be the only innocent man on the island. After help, after helping repel an attack from the outsiders, father uh, notes Robinson's abilities and asks him to join them. He refuses, saying he wants to leave the island. Got to go back to the island, Kate. Uh, fa- <laughs> it's hard not to make lost jokes during this. Father takes Robbins to the shore, explaining that they're 200 miles from the mainland. Gunships patrol 50 miles off the coast, and infrared satellite technology basically just basically the plot of Escape from New York. <laughs> That's it, on an island. <laughs> on an island. So. And so, uh, so uh, they monitor thermal activity such as large fires and explosions. The insiders have secretly built a scan-proof boat and launched it to tell the outside world about Absalon. However, the boat is destroyed by future copters, causing Father to believe that there's an informer among them. No, not Snow. Oh, nice. Now it's going to be stuck <laughs> in my head. You really just can't believe you did that to me. Yeah, of course I did. And everyone else. If you don't know what I'm talking about. No, nope, don't do it. Oh, it's done. All right. <laughs> Trying to do that once karaoke it did not go well. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> Robbins learns about a new boat and demands a seat. Still determined to escape after learning that the, the engineer uh, needs a distributor. This is this is where the movie loses me a little bit. Uh, part Robinson saw at the uh, at the outsiders camp. He offers to retrieve it in exchange for passage. The insiders agree. 
Ca- Casey follows Robbins, who infiltrates the outside camp and gets the engine part, but they're captured by the outsiders. Robbins is then fought, forced to fight Casey to the death. Knowing they both won't escape, Casey impales himself on Robbins' weapon. Robbins escapes and, uh, escapes a plan uh, execution and then is helped by an insider spy, ensuring the leader of the outsiders, Merrick. Knowing Merrick will attack an over uh, an over stern objection, Robinson convinces the insiders to abandon their camp, but not before uh, lacing it with booby traps. Booby traps. Booby. <laughs> he, st- <laughs> he stays behind to fire a stolen rocket a launcher that he had gotten from the at the beginning of the movie. Ignited uh, inc- incendiary bomb. Most of the outsiders die, and the warden interviews interviews. Um, intervenes that's the word i'm looking for when the satellites are triggered thermal remember thermal stuff father dies while defending robbins after uh from merrick after robson kills merrick he finds that the new boat uh incinerated and evidence that king has killed the engineer robbins forces king to give him new coordinates to the warden because the war you know the king was a spy uh, so uh robbins forces king to give a new coordinates to the warden for where he to land his helicopter on the island Robbins and his crew hijacks the helicopter, throw the warden out, and vows to spread the truth. King and warden are left behind as unseen outsiders close in on them. Credits. Yeah, the ending is really odd. <laughs> like, you kind of want just... I just needed a crumb more, but it was just kind of like, nope. The it, end. It, it's like they ran Eyeball. Out of, they, the end. But also, it's a true... It's a trend in early 90s movies, especially. Yeah. They're just like, oh, we're out of budget. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting, though, because watching it again. So there's, there's things that here's what I remember about this movie forever. And I think I told you this. I, I let you watch it first, because once I knew you had never seen it, I didn't want to talk about this one thing, which is Merrick's death. Merrick's death scene was and has forever lived on in my brain as one of the best on screen deaths ever. Not because it's particularly dramatic. It right. just looks so good. The stunt is so well oh, no, done. It looks, yeah, it, looks, it looks authentic. It is a fantastically edited shot. Everything about it. Every m- measure of it is fantastic. I also like, I also, and it's very graphic. I also like Robbins' fall. So when the outsiders at the beginning of the movie, when they're, they, they're chasing Robinson out, of the camp. Yep. And they fill him with the blow darts. He, get, he does a giant fall off a giant cliff. Yep. And they had special cameras lined up so they could catch the stump. It's a stump guy doing yep. that fall. Part dummy parts, most because it's a high right, but you know, but they've got the special cameras lined up so they can catch this shit. So you almost watch the fall in real time. Which oh, is, it's amazing. It's really sweet. It's, it's a great fall. It's a big fall. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big fall. <sighs> yeah. Um, so th- there's a lot of like really, really well composed elements and it's, it's man versus nature and literally, I mean, man, there's not a single woman. There's not a, a single female character that makes any kind of appearance in this whole day. Right, movie. The, 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 that's one of the things there are no women in this movie at all. It is me too free. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably not appropriate. Nah, they made the movie. <laughs> <laughs> we just pointed out. Um, yeah, I, I, I there's, so so I liked it. I really did. I was really surprised how much I liked it. I got really into it because a lot of these, especially these older movies, if you know, yep. I'll pop it on and it's just like, and then I just got riveted. Like the first few seconds of the film is the credits and then this dude gets shot in the face. Yeah. And, and, and it, I'm like, hello. And then, and then it goes into like, I like how they remind you it's in the, in the future because, you know, they're on this train. Right. And then I'm like, are they, and it's, I guess they're in the middle of the desert, but from in there, I was like, are they on Mars? Because I don't know where they're at. Yeah, I, it's th- really bizarre. It's a slow buildup. And right. So what I loved about it was I felt like the world was built appropriately, the outside world, right. literally. And then as you get dropped in on this island, suddenly you're back to this culture of very primitive man. But see, right? it's like, it fools you too, because like, um, you know, you I didn't go back and watch the trailer until after I've watched it. Right. Uh, and for, you know, and to, to put it on the website and, and the Facebook page, and so I, I had not seen it, but in my back of my mind, it's like, I, you know, I remember an island. I remember the, the cover of Ray Liotta holding this gun, like yep. in the jungle, and then the first thing you see, he's like in regular jail. I'm like, am I remembering the wrong movie? Right. <laughs> for like ten minutes, I'm just like, and because they go in this other, I mean, it's almost it, the Shawshank Redemption. There, you see, there's a whole other movie where Ray Liotta gets a cellmate, and then. That gets screwed up. <laughs> right. So, but that's what, like, I, 
as I watched it, it it's a lost art because that, that level of pacing doesn't work anymore. No. It was, a, it's not, like now people use this term and they use it a lot, like slow burn, all that. It's not that this was slow burn. It was just well developed. Yeah, it was. The pacing on it was, hey, we're going to take our time. You're going to get to know these people, your, your lead. You're going to know your protagonist um, well, and you're going to love your antagonist, which I do. I think he is my current... F- Watching it again, that dude's on-screen villainy is what I want in every villain forever. He's like... He's pleasant in some ways. Like, he's pleasant. He's a pleasant guy. Right. Like, you're kind of like... He's charming. Of, right. I could, I could see why people work for him. Oh, yeah. It, it, the problem with it, though, and this is why I think he's wasted, because... because the intent for the filmmakers are is that these guys are bad guys. Yeah. And so while he's a bad guy, he's very charming, right? He wondered. Right. And none of that leaks out to his people. Right. He's like the charming guy of a bunch of savages. Right. And so it's like, like reality that wasn't, wouldn't happen. Had that, you know, if he's going to be that charismatic, that's going to bleed. They may be vicious and whatever, but they're going to be a lot more pleasant than they are. Right. And so, and so, that's why I feel like he's wasted on this film. Oh, I, I wouldn't just, argue that. I mean, and his performance is the best performance in the whole entire. Oh, it's phenomenal. Because uh, Ray, Ray Liotta is definitely wasted. Yeah, I mean, and maybe literally wasted. <laughs> uh, I liked. I, I really liked uh, Stuart Wilson as as American. This and like we said, uh, Don Henderson um, as the he's the 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 mixologist. There's a great scene uh, between him and Ray Liotta after the first attack, and yeah. Ray Liotta's kind of coming to grips that if he wants to join the society or get off the island, you know, he, you know, he's having that turning point that, you know, good good characters have, you know, he's, he's got to accept the sword from, from, you know, that's right. And so, um, but the performance of that conversation that they have, Oh, it's just (laughs) well-rounded. Look, dude, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's written really well. Oh, a hundred percent. And it's directed really like, and the performance is really really solid because you're dealing with all these veterans. Right. Right. Again, it's almost like it's too good for this movie. Yeah. There's a lot a, of subtleties a, that way. A, a rest of this movie is is a, it's a it's a jungle action romp, right? And then there's these little little pellets of little little pockets of just brilliance. And anytime Merrick's on screen, is he's just he steals he just chews up the scenery and he steals the show. Yep. Again, I just want to see even even at his. <laughs> His death looked cool. It's a lame death. Yeah. Not deserving of that character. They right, just, right, right, and, right. And, But it's the Disney death. Disney death villains all fall. All right, right, he falls. Right. But the rest of it is, I mean, it's just, it's so good. It it's, is, it's really well made out. It's just so uh, Ernie Hudson's great in too. Even oh, yeah, though he, he doesn't play anything dynamic. No. Again, every role in this, there's no one that stands out as being, I didn't come across the entire time watching where I was like, eh, that guy's not, except for Ray Liotta. Ray right. Liotta just feels like, why is Ray Liotta in this movie? So R- Ray Liotta to me, his performance is almost like how I feel. It's not as flat as uh, Christian Stewart in Twilight. Yeah. But, you know, and she's, the big complaint about Twilight was her performance in that. that sure. I mean, outside of that. But for me, I, I I get it because in those books, you know, the women who read those books put herself in that character. Yeah, of course. So you don't want someone who's over. You want that to continue. Right. I'm Ray Liotta in this. I'm, I'm watching this. It's, uh, it's right. much like a video game. I'm, I will click in with Ray Liotta. He's my, he's my player character. And that's right. what, and so I'm good with it. I'm and so, you know, I, I get it, but he's very downplayed. He's not. He's it's great. But it fits his character at the end of the day, it right? Does, right. He's, yeah. he's a soldier, right? And and the crazy part is they really did it. I thought a, fa- a fascinating job. Again, not making a statement of it, but putting in there enough that it's not addressed. It, he's never healed from it, no. but he suffers severely from PTSD. Oh yeah, yeah. There's whole scenes of it where he's having right. hallucination and flashback, and it's and it's well done. Right. It's and it's never making light of it. It's almost like it was bringing it to the forefront of hey, this is a Problem right, kind of and thing. then way before it was again in the in, right in the news and stuff. I mean, PTSD has always been with us. I mean, right. you know, but you know, it's it's not been as shown dynamically on, and I'll almost I don't certainly know, not represented on the screen very well. Very well, and I think this is I think this is wonderful. Yeah. Um I like how we got to know the the characters and like the the prisoners and what they did, and you know. In the end of the day, all but realistically, one of them belonged to be there. Right. And even at the end, where when when the father, everyone believes that the father's innocent, and he's like, "Well, that still happened. I'm a cause of it." 
Right. He feels he's not innocent. Right. But he rightfully may be innocent. Right. And but everyone else is like I'm like even the engineer who's like no I'm staying I built a boat but I've I've done terrible things yeah I need to be here right this this just needs to change is all we were looking for is just a what they're doing to us is beyond right you know beyond cruel so let's let's fix that but I believe deserve to, deserve to be and a lot of them are just like no no we're terrible people we've right. done sin we've committed crimes we don't you know. <laughs> Which is crazy, which doesn't have, A, in a prison movie. Everyone's innocent in a prison movie. But but see, that's the interesting side of it. If maybe it's because they actually have, if you think about it, those prisoners, those super trapped on an island, fighting every day for their survival, they actually technically have more freedom than they would have in a prison. I think so, too. I mean, no they, one tells them what time to get right. up. No one tells them any of that. There's no regulations right. except, I mean, there's no, you can try and leave the island you're just probably going to get murdered. Right. Right. So I, I don't know. There's something really fascinating uh, in that sense of like it, it seeing what happens. I love the Lord of the Flies sort of overture uh, or over, overtones that kind of play throughout, which you have like these two groups that kind of form. I mean, it's a lot of Lord of the Flies moments, right? There's no piggy, but you have that, that right. sort of essence with Merrick and then and then father's group. I mean, the closest thing to piggy we got is King. And yeah. Not because of size or anything, but I mean, King is the weakest link in there and he's because he's, the, you know, he's the spot. That's he's, right. He's in there. He's and I liked him. I mean, I don't, the whole time I liked him. He was just no, that guy. That guy's been in a billion movies he's, too. He's so good. And, and just, he's always good. And what? That's what I'm saying. Like, there's no. I have no. Gas is super solid. Yeah. Super there's not solid. an issue. You can't bash on it. The story is pretty much airtight. It's pretty simple. Right. It's like, hey, here's the problem, and then things are revealed. Again, PTSD subtleties are, are brought in to add a little flavor right. to the story. But it's a simple story. It's it's believable. It is believable. Like I follow, the, like the, the the journey that we follow with Brady Liotta comes to to a head, and we follow that, and I buy all of it. Yeah. I buy every bit of it. So totally. I mean, even for a future you know, film, and you know, it's not dystopian. It's just dystopian on this island, but it's just it's. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> so uh, you know, it, I don't remember when the movie Fortress came out with Lambert, but it um. It's in that same sort of vein, except Fortress goes down this road of Real like quick, the way you say Lambert made me want to go to do to, to be fair that way Lambert <laughs> Lambert, Lambert. <laughs> Um, <laughs> to be fair, to be fair. Uh, it, you know it's it's got that but but Fortress kind of is all enclosed and feels claustrophobic and this and this had some scenes that were like well composed tension kind of slight horror movie moments right um early the beginning and the end of the film right right when he lands on the on the island on absalom and at the end of the film when the warden stuck there those scenes are really great right i mean yeah. that's kind of creepy stuff and it's shot like creepy stuff loved it just absolutely loved like it. that i just uh, so Here's what leaves me, and I had to ask a car, a gearhead buddy of mine, about this. Um, so they're building boat two because boat one destroyed, but boat two has an engine. They found an engine, but out of all the engine parts that they don't have, is a distributor cap that Ray Liotta happened to see that we don't see. Right, there's no context for <laughs> no it. No context, in. and so <laughs> I was like, I'm I, this. This is what I know about cars. Um. I put fuel in them, and a magic fairy makes it run. Right. Every so many thousand miles, I have to go to another magic fairy for oil, <laughs> and that does something. Right. <laughs> and that's all I know. <laughs> right. 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 No, I'm with you. <laughs> I mean, literally, it's just white people magic that makes that work. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> and so I, I, I was wondering about. Our distributor caps universal, so I asked a gearhead, and he's like, "Oh God, no!" Right. <laughs> so the chances of that actually working are next to nail. He goes, yeah, yeah. he says, uh, and I gave him a copy of the film because he'd never heard of it. I was like, oh, you need to watch this for this, and so it was. And I was like, he said, he tells me that if um, if they were both uh, eight cylinder engines, the distributor cap in there. There may be a slight way, <laughs> right, to, right, to, to to make that happen, <laughs> right. Now I get it. I totally get it. And so, '90s movie Liberty time, right? I just yeah. thought it was like that's, and that was, but look, out of the whole entire film, that's my only beef, and that's great. Oh, I know. It's the only beef I have, and it's and it's it's forgivable. I'd have picked another part. <laughs> yeah, sure. Something that's a little bit more. Yeah. Again, most people like me who probably, if I saw this in the theater, went, "Oh yeah, distributor cap." I know, I know what that, I know what it is. Yeah, I, don't I know would have done something simple like a spark plug that Merrick wore around his neck. Something just stupid where he's like, "I've seen that before." And you're right. like, 
oh shit, the and spark plug. plug. Right. Like fucking wait on it, you know? I don't know. And so uh, I dug it. Want some trivia? Yeah. Uh, going back to our gunship. So this is they're a Russian Kamov K-27 Helix anti-submarine helicopters. There we go. They feature a coaxial rotor. And this look unfamiliar, and that's probably futuristic to Western audience. I was like, future copter. Uh, do you know why Ray Leona took this movie? No. Because he wanted to play an action hero. That's it. Yep. Okay. Filmed it in Australia, Queensland. Oh, that's kind of fun. Uh, the rats that were crawling over Ray Liotta were lab rats. Oh, interesting. It's based on the, on the novel Penal Colony by Richard Har- Harley. The story is similar. It's not in the future. <laughs> and so... It's about it's basically about um, English people kicking kicking prisoners to another island that's not Australia. Uh, um, and you know, frankly, it didn't need to be set in the future. No. Nope. Yeah. And yeah, you know, and for us, it's not really that much farther. 20, no. Twenty two years. Benghazi. Uh, yeah, no joke. Uh, film. Uh, I I did not look up who he was in this film. I forgot to do that. But it's uh, film was described as Mad Max beat Fortress. Both films starred Australian actor Vernon Wells. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. So he's, that's funny. So uh came out in nineteen ninety four. Released April 29th. Ooh. What do you think his domestic total domestic was? Twelve million. Close, thirteen. Yeah. Uh no, fifteen. 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 Uh opening weekend was four point five. Oof. Where did it rank in five. the top, top five? Gotta be number five. Number one. No way. Number one. I guess April, maybe, but that's wild. Number one. The following, followed by With Honors, Four Weddings and a Funeral, Bad Girls, and Sirens. Oof. That's some tough, <laughs> uh, tough movies to watch there. <laughs> uh, came out in 94. Um, it, it finished in the top 100. Where did it, roll? Where did it fall? Oh, it's got to be in the 60s. I would say 63. 98. Ooh, at the bottom, son. It won its opening weekend, and it had a straight, it, it did pretty strong for a while, yeah. it's a, which is weird. And this is what. Because I can't find any information on why it's, it's not, not right. available and then forgotten. Right. Because it did well. And I'm like, you know, if you went, I mean, 1994 for its budget, I mean, it made its budget. Um, I don't know if it made its budget with advertising, but advertising was different in 94 anyway. So it, they didn't put the half half your movie budget in no, there. No, 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 no. By no means. So, so I mean. Is it a $15 million budget? Uh, it's 10 10 that's still pretty big for 94 so it makes five yeah makes five overall and that's not counting dvd right. sales and whatever right which was big at that time you know home home, home box of sales were big at, at the time so you know I, I i'm surprised there's not like a sequel or yeah i'm really really surprised and then i'm i'm more shocked that it's just kind of forgotten it is <laughs> it's on an island somewhere can you name the top four five movies of 1994 oh, God, i love no. this game i know I, you I love do this game i'm both. so bad on it I, that's why i like it i like it on both shows uh ghost that's 1990 <laughs> dang it i have no idea i have no concept of time that's my issue i have no concept would you like me to tell you yes back to the future too <laughs> you know i say that every time <laughs> no Number one, The Lion King. Oh, dang. Number two, Forrest Gump, which won the Oscar that year. Yeah, of course. True Lies at number three. Oh, that's a great movie. The Santa Claus at number four. And The Flintstones at number five. I didn't realize The Flintstones did that well. I didn't know they did that well either. It had a sequel, but I was like, I didn't realize it did that well. But it did. The Flintstones. The Flintstones. So that was No Escape. No escape. No escape. Um, uh, would you? Uh, oh, here's a, the question. How would you make this movie differently? You know, I, 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 cause I know it's coming. So I'm, I'm thinking about it. I have a tough time trying to figure out what I, it's not that it's so flawless that it doesn't get it. I just had a tough time innovating on again, without doing this, the easy answer, which is episodic. I had a tough time kind of innovating on where they were going. This is a very simple, straightforward piece, right? The only other thing I would do is maybe uh, is maybe definitely push it. If, if I was going to do it, I'd push it even further into the future so that that what we're actually, the characters have to deal with two, well, multiple problems. But one of the problems they have to deal with is they've gotten accustomed to a certain level and lifestyle of future living so that there is another challenge inherent in them of not just survival, but in like, going back to primitive ways to, to kind of do it. But I had a tough time processing through that. I didn't come up with anything great. Nothing I was ha- happy about. I would change its setting. Yeah. I would do it like, 
I wouldn't set it on an island. And I understand that there's the, 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 the idea of the islands that they can't escape. There's other places on the planet you can put some. So I would do like the Gobi or like the Mongolian. Siberia. You could do something really crazy. Or you could do Russian or, you know, if you want that Chinese money. Yep. You do it you know, like in Mongolia. And so it's because it's vast and you can just put it in the middle of one going and be like, good luck to getting out. Yeah. And so you've got societies in there and they just fly you in and drop you off in this area. Yeah. And so you do it. You do a Chinese based one. I think would be awesome, honestly. <laughs> no, no, I, I wouldn't be opposed to it. And uh, or or do if you do an island, you just add monsters because that worked for Lost. <laughs> yeah. Until you find out it's all just a joke. <laughs> Not jokes all. It happened sort of. Fifty percent. Seventy five. Yeah. I mean, the only other thing I guess you could spin off is if you, I, I think it would be kind of fascinating if you came back to the island and you revisited it. So the only thing I could propose instead of a remake would be a sequel. And the sequel is it's 15, 20 years later. Yeah, I think so too. And the the rest of the world is just completely trashed. Oh yeah. So like these dudes finally get off the island by hook or crook somehow. Like they test another boat and no one shoots it down or whatever happens and they get off the island and then you find out like civilization has gone to shit. And so now these men, because again, no ladies, these men are, are the most equipped to run the world now because they've been living in this post-apocalyptic land. Right. Now, right. I don't know. Something like that could be interesting or to see. I would, I would like to do something that, uh, brings the two tribes together. Right. The outsiders and the insiders, some sort of disaster that has, that forces them to unite. Right. Everything. Well, maybe they're close to Isla Nebular and a <laughs> dinosaur swims over and then they must unite to fight a <laughs> T-Rex. A T-Rex. <laughs> T-Rex. T-Rex. Um, I've picked it. I've picked, I've chosen our next week's or our next film. Oh boy. Um, and we're going to have a guest. I think I'm, 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 I'm hoping we're going to have a guest. Um, I have picked, we talked about it a little bit last time we did up uh, for FX, but I've, I've picked body snatchers. Oh, nice. Um, it's if, for those of it's available on Amazon prime. And if you, I think if you have stars, it comes with stars. Um, but it's on Amazon Prime for two ninety nine. Um, I ran into Chris Lott, our friend, yes, who uh, has wrote, written some music for us for the podcasts. And uh, the f- movie was filmed outside of uh, uh, Selma, where he lived. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, and so he has stories. Oh, fantastic! So we're gonna bring him in. Oh, we're, great! We're I love Chris. We're, great we're, dude. Yeah, I love great Chris too. So we're gonna bring Chris in if he's available. I, I, we're working it out. We're gonna bring him in, and we're gonna watch. Body Snatchers and he's on, oh, fantastic. on, on Body Fan- Snatchers. And he's a fantastic composer, by the right, way. Right, he's fantastic. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's wonderful. Wonderful. He did uh, Snakes Out of Compton. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. Yeah. I also, mean, it's a movie that should be on this podcast. Absolutely <laughs> right. He's a, uh, he's got, I've watched his career shine. He's done very well for and, himself. And I'm proud a, of him. And he's a good podcast guest, so he'll be fun. Great. So, yeah, he mentioned, I, I caught him at a, uh, the Mobile Public Library had a, like a one day con. I caught him there and he's like, oh, yeah, so I, we can start telling stories. Like, wait, hold those. Yeah. Let's get you on air. Yeah, so, that's great. So that's going to be cool. Well, this is Scotty saying this is our contribution to the multiverse. Go out and make yours. Kohas out. Thank you for listening to the Mobcast Network.